we sing my god how great you are how great how great you are just like that we sing my god how great you are how great how great you are lift your voice sing it i'll say my god Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Make it louder. My God, how great you are. How great. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, you're so great. My God, how great you are. How great you are. My God, yes, you are. Oh, tell him, tell him how great. My God, how great you are. How great, how great you are. Lord, we praise you, we praise you. My God, how great you are. Yeah. 
Christ to come With shout of acclamation And take me home Oh, what joy shall fill my heart Oh, yes Oh, then I shall bow Oh, in humble adoration And there proclaim Oh, my God, how great Thou art Then sing, then sing My soul, my Savior God To Thee end Oh, how great Thou art Oh, how great Thou art How great, how great, how great Then sing, then sing My soul, oh, my Savior God To him worship and we give him our heart we give him our soul he loves it he is a jealous God he wants all of us not just a piece of us he wants all of us and we give him all of us from the time we wake up from the time we go to bed not just here he is worthy
song we could ever sing. Yes, you are. Oh, and you're worthy of all the praise we could yes, ever bring. Lord, you're worthy. And worthy of every breath we could yes, ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you, Lord. Let's sing his name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Oh, you see that? And Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Yes, he's worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
love you, Lord. Oh, your mercies never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, church, sing it out. So all my life, so faithful, Lord. of the goodness of God and I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you were close like no other well I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend something special for you. He's here with you right now. Let him have his way. Please enjoy the rest of the service. Hi, 
Hi, and welcome. My name's Erin, and I'm the Director of Communications here at Kesed, and I am here to deliver your Kesed News. For all our new guests at our in-person services, we'd love to give you a small gift to say hello, which you can get at the Welcome Center in the lobby. Our Welcome Center team is also available to answer any questions you have and let you know how to find out more about upcoming events. Giving is one of the ways we participate in worship here at Kesed. If you feel on your heart to give through tithes and offerings, we have several ways to do that, which include our giving boxes, kiosks in the lobby, text to give, and our church app. Thank you for your generosity. Ladies, we hope you'll join us for our annual picnic and river flow on August 19th in Estacada, Oregon. This year's theme is Go With The Flow. If you don't want to float the river, we will have plenty of fun on shore with leisurely activities. We always have a blast, so we hope you'll come. For the men, we have a Taking Ground barbecue and cornhole event on August 20th, 5.30 p.m. at Casa Columbia. The cost is $10 per person, and we're gonna share a meal, play the game, and more. Last year was a really great time, and we hope you'll join us. Learn more and register for these and other events on our church app, our website under the events page, and you can also find out what's happening on our social media. Thanks again so much for joining us here at Kesed. Please feel free to take the next few minutes to say hello to someone, or you can use the QR code to fill out a hello card so we can get to know you better. We will continue with our service shortly. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Well, good morning. Um, I'm in a series right now called Oaks from Ashes, and uh, we are talking about different spiritual practices that uh, are really important for the Christian faith, especially foundationally. These things have been pulled from well over 2,000 years of Christendom uh, and, of course, the Bible, and they have just been really exciting to, to learn about, to take a little bit of a deeper dive into, and then to try and apply. And so I hope you're continuing to do those. Uh, they don't necessarily build on each other. We tried to build them sort of that way, but they are kind of each a standalone uh, topic that in and of itself uh, will connect you with not only God and the way that I believe we're supposed to engage him, but also each other. And I, I hope that you're trying to, uh, to figure out where those kind of sit within your person and within your spirit, including the topic for today. Uh, today we're going to talk about the spiritual practice of serving. And uh, it's an interesting topic because it's one that we are all called to participate in, but maybe not in the way that you thought. So let me start off this. Uh, I want to quickly clear something up. I'm not here today to ask you to serve more, to volunteer you for children's ministry, to uh, somehow get you on the worship team, which you know some of you think you should be, but we all know you shouldn't be. But... <laughs> That seems to be the one that everybody's like, I need to serve. Ah. It's like, no, sir, you don't. So just go back out and usher, right? Just go do what you, go, go help somewhere else where you, where you can be a gift to, to people. So, um, but there's, that's not the goal. The end goal is this. It's, the goal is not to get you to help more, give more, or, or participate more in the kingdom. The goal instead is to engage in a spiritual posture of serving in every area of your life. And the reason that I want to clarify that is because a lot of times what, what happens is people confuse serving for a program. And Jesus didn't come and offer a program. He offered himself as a person. And so what churches do, because our job is to, is to, is to obviously move forward this community and, and move forward its ability to reach people in the kingdom, is we often are like, it's about Jesus. And people are like, yeah, I get it, but I don't want to help. And we're like, but it's about Jesus. And you're like, I get it, but I don't want to help. And we're like, it's about this program. And then you're like, oh, I, I could probably do that once, once every other Sunday. And, and so I want to make sure and uh, remind you that it's really not at all about a program. And if that's what it's about for you, then, then you might be missing it. Instead, it's about that posture and that place in your life and mine that, uh, that truly allows you to be a person of of. of serving. Uh, I want to show you a quick video that I think illustrates the, the kind of serving that we're going to talk about today. 
And so uh, let me play this before you, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Pay real close attention, because I'm going to ask you a question at the end of it. Please watch. How special is that, huh? That video is from our Worship in the Round that we held just a few weeks ago. If you've not been to one, we do them about once a quarter. And the room is, is set up with like these different stations. First, we take all the worship and put it at the center of the room so that there's no stage focus. Everybody's, everybody's you know, kind of on the same level. Then we set up a baptismal. And we don't really take sign-ups only. People that very night can actually be prompted by the Spirit to respond to what he's doing in their life and be baptized. We have a prayer area over here. We have a communion area in the back. We had some art supplies and such. And it was just a really, really powerful night. So we wanted to capture it. We wanted to share it. And, uh, and we're going to continue to do more of them. So the question I have for you as you watch the video closely, making sure that you are ready to answer it, is did you notice all the servers? It's not the people in the pool, the pastors. It's not the worship leaders in the center. It's it's, 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 they're, they're there. You can see them in all the chairs that were had to, having to be turned, all 250 or so on the bottom floor. You can see them in the communion that was set up and the communion that was torn down. You can see them in those people who came in and set up the pool and then had to drain it and tear it back down. You can see them in the people who took all the papers and set them up on the prayer wall and then took all the prayers afterwards and have continued to pray over every single one of those prayers. You can see them in the ushers that were out in the front. You can see them in the greeters that helped people park in the parking lot. You can see them all across the video because none of that could have happened without servers. Serving is going to be a very difficult thing for us to talk about, and it's not because we don't do it in our lives. We all probably do it at some point in our lives and at, and at some level, but it's the one of the hardest, if not the hardest, spiritual practice to do the right way because true, true serving often happens in the hidden. And so there's a ton of servers in that video. You just don't see them. Foster uh, is going to be kind of my baseline for this talk more than all the other talks. You're going to hear a lot from him. He blew my mind with some of the stuff that he wrote about serving. And so I want to read this opening quote. He says, Nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service, and nothing transforms the desires of the flesh like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whines against service, but screams against hidden service. This is for all the church people in the room. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition, and it will devise subtle, religiously acceptable means to call attention to the service it rendered. Now, I'm a church brat, right? I grew up sleeping on a pew from the very beginning. And you know you're a church brat, too, if you're laughing at that, because you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And they were the cloth pews, right? Not even like, like the ones that left imprints on the side of your face when you woke up and you were two, right? I, don't, I was one of those kids that was raised on, like, lifesavers and gum to keep me quiet during service. <laughs> and I love church. I mean, my wife thinks I'm weird. I'll go to church on vacation. I'll go to church, you know, if I find a church. I just drove by the other day, and I was like, I didn't know they had a Saturday night service. And I was like, like I'm like, how can I get in there? And I, I, just, I just love it. But here's the thing about church as well. Church offers programs more often than it offers the person of Jesus. And I think many, many times I have been trained to serve in a certain way that just quietly, subtly gives a little bit of credit to me 
over the years. And I think maybe you have too. So now that we're all on the same page about what today's about, the kind of service we're going to talk about, hidden service per se, I want to get into it. There's really two grand angles when it comes to proper healthy service. Uh, one that is, is more common and one that is a little less common, but both of them are proper healthy ways to uh, kind of approach service. It is both serving and being served. Serving and being served. The Bible talks a lot about both. So let's start off with the angle of serving. Serving may be the most difficult spiritual practice to do correctly. This is because of how close and easily exchanged true service and self-righteous service can be. They're really hard to distinguish. As a matter of fact, most of the time, the only thing that, you, that can distinguish them is your willingness to ask the Holy Spirit, am I doing this for my benefit or yours? Which nobody wants to do, including myself, by the way. I want to do something grand and, and, and great in a, in a serving way, and then I just want it to work and, and, and not really ask how edifying was that to me versus how edifying was it to God. Self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve and is affected by my moods, my whims, and is highly concerned with my results. Yeah, that's when you get programmatic in your serving, when you're like, man, I hope that thing turned out well. Well, well, well no, if it turned out well, how many people showed up? Oh, really, only that many people? Why so many than last year? Is it because we, we didn't promote it well enough or our social media approach wasn't as good or... I mean, is it because we didn't pray over it well enough? Is that why it wasn't it was easily attended? We, we, you know, you could find Christian ways in order to, to spin that stuff. When the truth is, sometimes God's like, no, I just wanted to speak to 30 people instead of 90 this year, so why don't you shut up and just let me at the head of the table? I know God can be offensive that way. That hurt my feelings too when he, when he convicts me like that. Thank you for your empathy. <laughs> or was that wow for you because you were like, whoa, chill out. This is church. I came here to feel good. Well, it's not about you, sir, so it's not about any of us. That's the point. On the other hand, true service finds it almost impossible to distinguish the small from the large service. It's just about serving. It's just about who I am and what I'm supposed to be and, and this person that God put in front of my life and, and I'm supposed to meet a need. And if I can, in a way that God gets all the credit and I get very little, if none. These two things flip and flop inside us as we follow God wherever he leads. They flip and flop so often inside us that we can almost uh, be embarrassed by the times when uh, self-righteous service kind of usurps and becomes the one that is of great focus. Jesus himself was by far, even, even according to people who don't believe Jesus is God, people still equate him to the greatest servant that ever lived. Even people who are like, hey, he's a historical figure, an amazing servant, definitely not anything spiritually powerful about him, but boy, can the world learn, learn a lot from his serving. And he took on like, like some guys he called disciples, and he taught them how to serve like, like live action. They saw him daily serve them, serve each other, all these kinds of beautiful things. So if anybody was going to be an expert on how to, how to mute the, the flesh's wine, what does Foster say? It whines against uh, any kind of hidden service. If anybody was going to be able to embrace that, it would be the disciples of Jesus. And it says he's walking along one day, and literally the passage starts with an argument arose among them. My guess is it started a little further down the line as they walked down the trail, you know, with somebody like Peter saying, listen, clearly I'm the greatest among us. I'm the, the best. I am the rock. And then John's like, I am the beloved. And nobody loves a rock, so who cares, right? And they get into the thing. And it spreads and spreads and spreads until maybe dinner that night when it finally just breaks forth. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. That's a healthy conversation to have amongst your friends, isn't it? You guys should try that tonight when you just have after church lunch. So let's talk about it. Who's the greatest here at the table? It's just unwise in every way. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, it's not even about the argument. It's about what was happening inside them. Jesus, knowing the reasonings of their heart, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, 
Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is greatest. This is a child who probably has no idea what's going on. He's, he's probably there just as, as part of the, the, you know, the brigade that is built. And Jesus takes him. Maybe he knows him enough to stand next to him. And he's like, yeah, this, this, is, this is what being the greatest looks like. You serving somebody like him who probably won't even say thank you because kids are rude like that sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, not all of them. Someone who won't even, has no power to, to, to reward you for your service. Someone who you get no credit for, no. I mean, you can hand a kid like the most thoughtful thing and they'd be like, eh, I wanted it in blue. And you're just like, ugh. Like kids are just honest that way. And Jesus says, whoever serves here, this is how the kingdom of heaven works and how greatness is accounted for. We all like the idea of greatness, but I don't think we often understand what it actually means. I think sometimes we're like, well, great, you know, it'd be selfish for me to want to be great myself. And I, I don't know about that. I think it's an inner desire. So, so you may think, well, my motive for service, as long as my motive's good for service, then, 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 you know, this idea of serving the least of these doesn't really matter. Well, I don't know if you have put it together, but pretty much uh, scholars believe that everyone uh, that's, that uh, was a disciple of Jesus, except for Peter, was most likely a teenager. So basically, Jesus was a youth pastor at best. Which meant, as someone who was a youth pastor for 10 years, you know the moms are showing up. I've had a lot of difficult talks with moms. Uh, moms are, are often very involved in, in the lives of their children, especially their teenage children. And I really enjoy in this next passage when it comes to kind of, kind of looking at how motives work when it comes to serving, that Jesus himself even has a mom that shows up and has questions for him about how, she's past, how he's pastoring her boys. Matthew 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, with them in tow. How embarrassing. Like, mom, I don't want to do this. He's the Messiah. Well, he'll be the Messiah, but I'm the mom. So, like, I mean, that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of thing moms say. And, and you, know, you know this is going down this way because of the tone of Jesus. Listen, it says, she came up with her sons and she kneeled before him and she asked him for something. And he said to her, look at the Messiah of all creation's response. What do you want? <laughs> That's the words of Christ. That's what you get when you go to Jesus with a, with a motive that you've covered up. But really, he's just like, what do you want? I love it. What do you want? So she said to him, here's her motive. It's not for her. It's for her boys. Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. She says, say they'll be great. Make them great. Choose them above the others. And Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And the boys looked at their mom, who was like, yes, you can drink that cup. <laughs> and they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. You see, true kingdom greatness demands that we drink deeply from the cup and share in the cost that comes with serving others. It's just how it feels. And honestly, I just, I'm just going to say this. True serving, especially hidden serving, but true serving, when it costs you, doesn't often feel very good. As a matter of fact, if you're just like, I love the aroma of when I serve somebody. I love how it's, how, I love all the posts that I get, you know, and all the likes that I get when I post serving somebody. And people are like, what? You're so humble. And you're like, what? I'm not humble, you know? I'm, I mean, I'm more humble than last year, but I'm not, you know, no, stop. When people love the smell of their own service, it's most likely not serving. As a matter of fact, I think oftentimes when it stings, when it costs, that's when it's probably the truest it's supposed to be. Even the disciples who apparently were standing around watching this mom cut in line spiritually, were unhappy with it. It says that when the ten heard it, that this mom had asked, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, 
You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In service, we must experience the many little deaths of going beyond ourselves. And then take this as a gift, for it was lobbed into my heart as well. For service banishes us to the mundane, the ordinary, the trivial. You want to process where in your life you're serving appropriately? Better yet, maybe where in your life you're holding serving appropriately. It will probably be in the areas that are mundane, ordinary, and to you even trivial. This is why more than any other single way, the grace of humility is worked into our lives through the discipline of service. Humility, as you may know, is not one of those virtues that you can gain by seeking it. Well, what are you going to do this year? I'm going I'm to be more humble. That's my New Year's resolution. I'm just going to be more humble than all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you, you're like, well, this has been a waste of six months. You know, that's, that's no fun. I, I, it just doesn't work. It happens when we set down our desire to be the center of attention and serve. That's when humility happens. When Jesus gathered his disciples for the Last Supper, they were once again having trouble deciding who was the greatest. They were in an upper room, and in this culture, whenever you would rent a room or you would be the guest of someone who had a room that a party this size could have dinner in, a servant would always be present to wash the feet of those who had walked in from the road. In this case, however, apparently no servant had shown up, and none of the disciples, surprise, had volunteered to play the role of least among them. And so there's all sorts of tension and space and messiness. See, when, whenever there is trouble over who is the greatest, there is trouble, trouble over who is the least. That is the crux of the matter for us, isn't it? Most of us know we will never be the greatest. Just don't let us be the least. This is where the churchiness starts slipping in because we're like, listen, I know I'm not going to be as, as good at that as this or as good at that as this, but definitely don't, don't, I don't want to be the one who washes the feet. I don't want to be the least of the group or the least of the community or the least of the family. I may not be like, you know, the patriarch. No one's going to be as good as grandpa. But I definitely don't want to be like aunt so-and-so, right? I just don't. I can't. And that's just how we process. We, we don't always seek after the greatest, but we certainly shun with great repulsion the least. So Jesus is watching this, and he's thinking, I should have picked older folks in order to be my disciples. And he decides to teach them yet again. John chapter 13, right at the beginning of the chapter. Now, before the feast of the Passovers, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, listen to this phrase, I'm going to go back and rewrite it for you. He loved them to the end. Remember that phrase, that this is an example of how Jesus loves them to the end. It says, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. So everybody's arguing. Everybody's waiting to eat because custom is somebody has to do this. And Jesus is watching, and he realizes the time has come for him to love them to the end. And it says he pushes out his chair, or in this case, they would have been on the floor on a mat. He stands up. And they're like, Jesus, what are you doing? It's not, it's not time to, to eat yet. It's not time to go. Just a second. We're trying to figure out. And Jesus is like, mm. Whenever Jesus, you ever have that mom or that dad who can go, mm. And the whole room just goes, ugh. Says he rose from supper. Said he takes off his outer garment. And they're like, what is happening? And it says he took a towel 
and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And I think there was utter silence in the room as he moved from person to 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 person. And he served them. Jesus took a towel and a basin and redefined greatness at that moment in humanity. You can see this picture even better, I think, in the, one of the earlier versions of the NIV, like the 19, I think it's the 1984 version. It's now a very famous line. I'll read that earlier passage, verse 1, from that version. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. And the other passage, and most do, say he loved them till the end, where this one says he now showed them the full extent of his love. So it's not the miracles they've witnessed the three years prior. It's not the campfire intimacy conversations. It's not the, the theology lessons. It's not the, 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 the demon casting. It's not the feeding of the poor. It's not, it's not any of those things. The full extent of his love is serving them in a way that they cannot miss, that they do not deserve to be served. That's the full extent of Christ's love. He is teaching them and he is teaching us still today that you only love someone as much as or to the extent you are willing to serve them. And I hope that floods some of the marriages in this room. Because you teach your spouse really, really well. And you provide really well. And you share your feelings of disappointment really, really well. I hope it pours into some of the parents in the room because you teach your children really, really well. You provide for them really, really well. And you share your feelings really, really well. I hope it pours into the children in the room because you're kind to your friends when they do what you want to do, when they play by the rules. But what about when they don't? We only love people to the extent we serve them. This is what Jesus is showing, and this is what we are supposed to be picking up from this moment. And this is exactly why most church communities are dying today. Do you know the average church in the U.S., I think it's down to right around 78 or 80 people nationwide, the average church. There's a reason for that. There's a reason there's a whole bunch of churches sitting in big, giant, paid-off buildings built 70 years ago. It's because the church is slowly losing servers. There's just not enough people with this heart posture. I've heard it described with this simple picture that was sent to me just recently. The church is not a cruise ship where a handful of people serve everyone else who is relaxing. No, the church is a battleship where it's all hands on deck and everyone serves the mission. Hmm. Now, Kesed, I think, is unique. We have more people than that. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But I think we also have more servers than the average church, and I think a lot of it has to do with our legacy of set up teardown. Do you know it used to take over 140 people a weekend just to set our church up into Clark College and tear it back down? 140. There were people who got up at 4 in the morning to get to the U-Haul by 4.30 to, during winter especially, chip it out when it was snowed in or iced in, and we had two other trailers on top of that, and, and we had this massive army of people, and I think the legacy of that is still here. But the reality is I was talking to Tom about this part of the message, and I said, Tom, how are we doing? How does this relate? And so he ran some numbers. This is, this is what he asked me to share and what I was on my heart to share with you. Kesed right now has about 900-ish people, let's say, that attend in person on the weekend between two campuses during summer. Okay, now, you, we all know that not all of you go to church every single Sunday. I mean, I don't go to church every single Sunday. So, it's, so let's, say it's, let's say that our church, let's just bump it 100 people just for fun and make it 1,000 people. There's another roughly 1,000 people that watch online from somewhere in our community or the U.S., and we even have some folks from overseas. So about 2,000 people will say they call this church their home. And I'm running low numbers. 
Tom said, as of right now, all in, people who are either giving, serving, or both, there's about 500 people that are consistent with that. That means one in four people within our church community serves the other three. Are we a cruise ship or a battleship? For some of you, you're like, we're definitely a battleship because I have been shoveling coal for years in this place. <laughs> Wait a second, there's other options? It's <laughs> like, <laughs> not what I'm saying. You fourth, you're staying there. You're not free. Stay the servants that you are. And that's giving, serving, or helping. But there's a bunch of other people that are enjoying the sun deck way too much. You've just been swimming your time and kissing away and complaining about the casino because the odds are stacked against you. <laughs> I could run this illustration out as far as you'd like, folks. The reality is we as a church need more people that help, just like every other church. But it takes being in a posture of serving to do it well because we don't need, what we don't need are people who give and expect, you know, like pats on the back. I've said this before. I'm going to continue to teach it. I don't see who gives what here at the church. So when you write a big old check and then walk by and give me a wink in the lobby and I just look at you like, I'm not a winker, first off, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> people might take it wrong, so you'll never catch me winking. But some of you, you've given me and I'm like, why is this person so happy this Sunday? And, and I, I think I've come to realize like, oh, you helped out with such and such and you think I know. That's not the kind of serving that we're offering or wanting to promote here. I've shared before as well that I went to a church one time where people had like different, different buttons that went up their sleeve and it was like it started off with like copper and then like copper and half silver and then full silver and then half silver gold and then go. it just went up and it, come to find out it was their different giving levels that year. If we did that in our church, some of you would just be wearing post-it notes, right? right? Just paper. <laughs> just paper. <Right. laughs> it's all you get is a post-it note. Because <laughs> you're like, I bought a $3 hot dog. I sent this much of a kid to camp. I know that much. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not trying to get personal. It's just, you know, it's too much sun, not enough rain. <laughs> we need people who want to help. We need people who want to serve in a hidden way. It doesn't mean it can't be big ways or small ways. It just means we are called to be people who serve as God has called us. Brother Lawrence, the, the very famous, very famous uh, spiritual uh, example of, of what a person following God could be, uh, did many, many powerful things in his life. And yet the, the story goes that he did, work, he did uh, dishwashing as his worship and as his service dishwashing like he would go you know let's say teach a lecture or or teach a you know the class that day and then everybody's like that was amazing my mind's blown and he's like yeah now put your dishes on my tray I'm gonna like what what but this is how he operated and he said this it's not the greatness of work which matters to God but the love with which it is done Amen. Mm. some of you have some evaluating to do around serving and why you're doing it, or why you're not doing it. And, and wherever you are in your life, your marriage, your story, your singleness, your, your, your employed, unemployed, whatever it is, you are a human being that is in the stream of life right now for however many years you have left. And your calling in mind is to show people who Jesus is, maybe not with your mouth, maybe not with a sermon, maybe not with a song, but most certainly with serving. Let's talk just for a second about being served. The best example of the importance of being able to be served happens right here in this same upper room when Peter, while Jesus is moving through the different disciples and washing their feet, tries to deny the Christ washing his feet. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? He's basically saying, this is I think a modern way that we would say it, someone comes to serve us and we go, oh no, I'm good. I'm good. Peter's like, Jesus, I'm good. I mean, you can wash everybody else's feet, but, but I'm good. I, I'd rather eat with dirty feet, Lord, and break custom and culture than, than have your beautiful messianic hands upon these feet. And Jesus looks at him. And at first you might think, like, this is an example. Like, maybe the other disciples were like, oh, shoot. Should we have said no, God? Because Peter, you know, he gets some stuff right sometimes. 
And Jesus answers him and said, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Jesus kind of is gentle about Peter, this is going to happen. And Peter literally says to him, you shall never wash my feet. See, the I'm good represents what's really deep inside, which is like, uh, this, this is making me uncomfortable being served in this way. And, and I'm, just, I'm just refusing. I, I'm, I'm not just good. I'm not allowing it. So for those who are terrible at being served in the room, this next phrase from God himself, Jesus to Peter, is also for you. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Basically, get out. If you're not willing to be served, leave. And Peter looks into the eyes of Christ and sees he ain't playing around and says, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and head. (laughs) I love him for that, right? He's like, you ain't doing it. Do it all, God. And this is kind of what I think we need broken open here at Kesed. We need people who are willing to serve, yes, but we also need people who are willing to be served. You see, we are all called to receive well the offering of service from others, all of us. There are a few people that would much rather wash feet than have their own washed. It's not that common, but it does happen. They would say, basically, I'm good, and I'd much rather give than receive, but it's not really always out of humility. More often, it's about the pride of being labeled the helper versus the credit of being the helped. You want to be the helper, but you don't want that credit that you needed help. You don't want, you don't want that debt owed to you. Like, no, 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 don't, don't credit me as the, as the helped. I'm a helper. I'm a server. Didn't you hear Danny's three quarters of his first sermon? I, I, I want to be him or her. But that's not what Jesus teaches us about serving. Not long before Jesus washed his disciples' feet, this happened. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head, and he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, once again, there's that word, they were indignant. Why the waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor, meaning we could have served so many people with this, Jesus, if you just wouldn't have let her serve you. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, this is what he says about this woman now, and his willingness to let her serve him and her willingness to serve him, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. By Jesus allowing her to serve him, he blessed her more than he was blessed by her. When you refuse to allow someone to serve you, you steal their blessing for yourself. The bottom line is you're not allowed to deny someone from receiving the blessing of serving you just because you are uncomfortable or it stings your pride, period. Only through the spiritual practice of serving by fully engaging in the acts of serving and being served as a whole, can we move the kingdom mission forward and transform our church into the battleship that goes out and reaches the, the, the heartache of war that we're called to, to speak the gospel's love and healing, healing and wholeness into instead of the cruise ship that some of us are enjoying right now. This is a friend of mine, Claudine. Claudine's 91 years old, and uh, this is Aaron and I visiting her in her retirement home. Claudine was one of the, the, the members of uh, First Baptist here. I think there were around 35 people or so, maybe a little more, uh, that uh, decided unanimously to give us this building a few years back. Claudine uh, sacrificed her own, her own hopes and dreams and desires and even some of her own tastes because she wanted to serve the kingdom and be a servant of the kingdom. I remember that the biggest thing she had a problem with was the sound and the volume because at her age especially, she said it hurt her ears, but that didn't keep her from coming to worship. Nope, she'd sit in the back with a smile on her face and the gun range headphones put over her ears. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I'll never forget it. We had an open house a while ago, and Claudine wasn't able to make it because she had some health issues. 
And my wife Erin in staff meeting said it was on her heart to go and get her and take her on her own little personal tour sometime during this week. And while I was prepping this message, Claudine showed up with my wife. When I saw her, I knew what I was preaching on and I kind of knew what was happening. And I said, Claudine, do you care if I record this for the church, this tour you're going to get? And she goes, well, how do I look? <laughs> and I said, you, you look great. I mean, you're, you're 91. You're gorgeous, right? And she, she smiled and she said, okay, that's fine. And this is the, the messy little video that, uh, that I made. Claudine, this is the brand new Kessid Church office. Wow. What do you think? Do you get anything done besides talk? <laughs> <laughs> Look, listen, Joe's in here right now. Say hello, Joe. Hello. Hi, Claudine. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming and visiting us. I'm glad to be able to come and visit. Claudine, this, uh, this is the church that that you gave away to us. And, and I, we just Not thought it was- what I gave away. Well, <laughs> it, it looks different now. It sure does. But it's really special and, and you, you chose to serve another community and another group. And we're just very grateful to you for that. Well, thank you. There's a lot, about 20, no, 34 others. That's right. Involved. Yep, 35 total. This was the library. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and we kept the fireplace across. It's changed a bit, huh? <laughs> it's not a library. No. It's not a library of any years. Oh, but... I mean, you've toured everything. You've seen it all. What do you think? They have made a good use of all the space. And I'm glad that they're able to do that. And I wanted to praise the Lord the whole time. Mm -hmm. And whatever they do, mm -hmm. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> We're really grateful for you and your willingness to let us steward it. And uh, yeah, we love you. Thank you. You're welcome. Selfishness and pride are systemic. They happen within a system. And selfish, prideful people begot selfish, prideful people, and, and, and on and on and on we go serving ourselves. But selflessness and love are also systemic. And so when Claudine and the family from First Baptist gave this building away, tons of people within the churchdom started evaluating their buildings. Another church came because of that decision and gave us the Columbia campus out of that. Erin decides on her own, own, my wife, to go and serve Claudine, who then allows me to do a video, which, you know, she didn't really love, but was willing to serve you. And on and on and on we go. This is why this is such an important tenet and practice of our faith. This is why we must drink deeply from the cup of Christ and all that it entails. So I have two things we're going to do. We're going to close here in just a moment with communion. It's going to be a different kind of communion. Uh, because what I'm going to do is I have uh, four tables, I believe. I have two over here and I have some up in the balcony. And because I don't want anybody getting their own communion just to symbolically represent being served and serving, I'm going to ask for volunteers out of the audience to come stand behind a table, four here, four there, and then uh, however many are, can fit upstairs that have never served anyone else communion before. Communion is pretty simple. There's a small cup with juice that represents the blood of Christ and a small cup with bread that represents the body of Christ. And these two things represent drinking deeply from Christ and who he is and the greatest act of serving and love that has ever 
been known to this world and that is him dying upon the cross. And so people are gonna be serving other people communion. Now, for those of you being served, you might think, but have they been, have they been communion trained? Like, don't, are they prayed up? Nope, don't even know, don't even know. They're just gonna be people like you serving people like you because that's ultimately what Jesus wants us to do. My last little encouragement is this week, I'd love you to pray a simple prayer. Simply maybe start your day, end your day or both with Lord Jesus as it would please you. Bring me someone today whom I can serve and may you consider adding in the hidden ways. This, this is who we're supposed to be. This is the difference we're supposed to make. And I hope it just transforms our church wildly. Let's pray together. Let's receive from the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and space. Thank you, Lord, for uh, what it is that uh, you want to reveal within Kesed to make a difference, to create a movement, maybe, God, to just transform our church. May we be generous, God. May we be servants. May we, may we love deeply and pay costs for one another, starting in our own marriages, our own families, our own circles of influence, this church, and so on. We thank you, Lord, for your willingness to serve us and to move with us and to bless us. We just enter into this time of communion now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you get the cup and the juice and you go back to your chair, you just take it anytime you feel ready. And Dave will just sing for a while until we've all received it and he'll dismiss.
Nothing else. Nothing else. 